Welcome back, everybody, to another deep dive. And uh, today, we're going to try to take you inside the mind of Donald Trump. Oh. Courtesy of his interview okay. with Joe Rogan. That's a long one. Yeah. It was uh, recorded just earlier this month. Yeah, October 2024. And it covers a lot of ground. Yeah. We're going to do our best to break it down for you. But, uh, you know, just as a warning. Buckle up. It's a wild ride. Yeah. So Trump starts off, you know, setting the stage. Mm hmm by describing this surreal experience of moving from his newly built hotel in Washington, D.C. Right, on Pennsylvania Avenue. Straight into the Lincoln bedroom. Which, I mean... At the White House. That's a flex. Yeah. So what do you make of this? Well, I think it's a very calculated way to start the interview, right? He's painting himself as this outsider, you know, thrust that... into this world of ultimate power, but also ultimate scrutiny. Right, and he's contrasting the grandeur of the White House with... You know, what he describes is these relentless attacks that he faced <laughs> from the media, from political opponents and so on. And it kind of sets up this this narrative yeah. that we're going to see play out throughout the interview of him as this, you know, victim in many ways. Yeah, he's the outsider. Yeah. Battling against these entrenched forces. Right. And he even brings in Abraham Lincoln talking about how, you know, Lincoln must felt melancholy living in the White House. Right. And how he can relate to that. Drawing a parallel between himself and, you know, one of the most revered figures in American history. Right. It's a way to humanize himself, but also it's, I think, a way to kind of subtly elevate his own image. Yeah. He's putting himself in that same category yeah. as this, you know, historical giant exactly. who faced tremendous challenges. Mm -hmm. So then we get into the, you know, kind of the nitty gritty of governing. Yeah. And... Trump talks about making some bad personnel choices. Right. He specifically regrets appointing John Bolton as his national security advisor. Yeah. He even mentions this friend of his, Phil Ruffin, uh -huh. casino magnate, who apparently warned him about Bolton. Yeah. But the advice came too late. Yeah. Too late. <laughs> so again, this kind of reinforces that outsider image, right? Yeah. Like he was learning on the job. He didn't have the deep network of experienced advisors right. that you would expect from, you know, someone who had been in politics for a long time. Right. He's coming in fresh. Right. And he's making these mistakes. And he's admitting to them. Right. And then we get to the defense of his economic policies. This is where it gets really interesting because yeah. Rogan doesn't really push back much at all. Yeah. Trump claims that his tax cuts actually increased revenue. Which, you know, a lot of economists dispute that claim. Yeah, and he doubles down on his support for tariffs. Right. Saying that tariffs are necessary to protect American jobs and industries. And it's important to pay attention to this, right? Yeah. The level of scrutiny or lack thereof from Rogan, mm. because it really gives Trump a platform mm -hmm. to present these views often unchallenged. Right. And it's a pattern that we're going to see throughout the interview. So then they move on to energy and Trump slams... Biden's policies, particularly the decision to stop drilling in Alaska's Anwar region. He says that that decision would made the U.S. energy independent yeah. and that we could have even been supplying energy to Asia. Right. And of course, he contrasts this with what he sees as, you know, this push for wind energy, which he calls environmentally disruptive. Right. And these electric car mandates, which he says are too expensive and inefficient. And this is just, you know, classic Trump, right? Yeah. It's like this very black and white view. No nuance. There's no nuance. And what's interesting is Rogan, again, doesn't really press him on any of these points. Right. So then we get to another hot button issue. Immigration. Everett Trump goes on this lengthy rant. Yeah. Claiming that hundreds of thousands of criminals have entered the U.S. through open borders. Yeah. He places the blame squarely on Biden's policies. Right. And he even goes as far as to say that Venezuelan gangs have taken over apartment buildings in cities like San Antonio. Yeah. In Aurora, Colorado. These are very inflammatory claims. Yeah. And again, Rogan doesn't ask for evidence right. or challenge them in any substantial way. Yeah, it's very interesting to see how this dynamic plays out. It is. So then we get to the big one. Oh, boy. The 2020 oh. election. Here we go. Trump unsurprisingly repeats his claim that the election was rigged. And stolen. And stolen. Hmm. He points to the 51 intelligence officials yeah. who questioned the authenticity of Hunter Biden's laptop. Right. And for those who don't recall, that was the story that was circulating in conservative media yeah. before the election, claiming that there were emails found on Hunter Biden's laptop that were yeah. damaging to Joe Biden. Right. And that these intelligence officials were trying to suppress that information. Right. So Trump uses this along with, you know, the increased use of mail-in ballots during the pandemic mm -hmm. as supposed evidence of fraud 
Right. And of course, he pushes for a return to paper ballots and voter ID. Which, you know, has been a common theme in Republican circles for, for many years. Yeah. And Rogan actually does push back a little bit here. A little bit. He points out that both sides of the political spectrum, you know, they often refuse to accept election results. He brings up Hillary Clinton. Yeah, he mentions Hillary Clinton. As an example. As an example. Yeah. But what's interesting is he doesn't directly challenge Trump's specific claims of fraud. Right. So it's this kind of like partial pushback. Yeah. It's not a full-throated, you know, debunking of these claims. It's more like, well, yeah, both sides do it. Right. But he doesn't really get into the weeds of whether or not there's any actual evidence to support Trump's claims. Right. And Trump actually brings up Elon Musk's, you know, opinion on this. Right. That paper ballots are the only way to ensure fair elections. Which, you know, again, that's a very debatable point. Yeah. But Rogan doesn't really challenge him on that either. Right. He also talks about how these voting machines are, you know, 10 times more expensive and vulnerable to hacking. And he goes after Gavin Newsom, the governor of California, for signing a bill Mm -hmm. that prohibits officials from asking about someone's voter ID status. Right. So it's all very much, you know, playing into this narrative yeah. that the system is rigged. And they're out to get him. Against him and his supporters. Yeah. And it's interesting to see how Rogan kind of just lets him... Let's him run with it. Run with it. Yeah. Without really challenging these claims in any meaningful way. Right. Okay, so we've covered a lot in part one. But we got to get to this last part of the interview where Trump starts talking about the JFK files. Yeah, this is where it gets really interesting. Yeah. And maybe even a little spooky. Right. So he claims that he was asked by unnamed officials. Oh, of course, unnamed. Not to release the full JFK files when he was in office. Right. Citing national security concerns. Yeah. He hints at the potential impact on living individuals. Right. It's all very cloak and dagger, you know. Yeah. Fueling all sorts of speculation about what might be in those files. Exactly. And then, of course, in classic Trump fashion, he dangles this tantalizing promise If he wins the 2024 election, he'll release the full JFK files. I mean, you got to give him credit for knowing how to keep people hooked. Right. It plays into people's curiosity, their desire for, you know, hidden truths. It makes him seem like he's holding on to these explosive secrets that only he can reveal. Right. And then as if the JFK files weren't enough, he segues right into UFOs. Oh, yeah. I got to love a good UFO story. He acknowledges that he's been told a lot about UFOs. A lot, but he doesn't really give any specifics. No, he's incredibly vague. Just keeps repeating that the information is highly classified, which, I mean, that's the go-to response, right? Yeah, it's like the ultimate conversation stopper. Right. But he does say something interesting. What's that? He jokes that he can say whatever he wants, now referencing the controversy surrounding Hunter Biden's laptop. Oh, yeah. That's a clever way to deflect attention from his own evasiveness. Right. He's basically saying, look, they're already accusing me of all sorts of crazy stuff, so what do I have to lose? And at the same time, he's taking a jab at his political opponents. Right. So it's a win-win for him. Yeah. So taking a step back, what do you think this interview tells us about Trump's mindset in 2024? Well, I think it's a fascinating mix. You see the grievance, the unwavering conviction in his own narrative, and that strong desire to return to power. He's definitely not shy about any of that. No, not at all. What I found most striking, though, was the level of access and free reign Rogan gave him. Yeah, it it almost felt like Rogan was giving Trump a platform to air his grievances and present his version of events without much pushback. You're absolutely right. While there were a few moments where Rogan offered some mild pushback for the most part, he allowed Trump to control the narrative. It really makes you think about the role of platforms like Rogan's in shaping political discourse. Especially when you consider the size of Reagan's audience and the fact that many of his listeners are already sympathetic to Trump's message. Right. So this interview wasn't a balanced debate. Not at all. It was more like an unfiltered glimpse into Trump's worldview presented largely unchallenged. Which makes you wonder if this kind of platform can actually contribute to the spread of misinformation. That's a real concern. It's not just about what was said, but also what was left unsaid. The questions that weren't asked, the evidence that wasn't challenged. It all highlights the importance of critical thinking and media literacy in today's world. Absolutely. You can't just passively consume information, especially when it's coming from someone like Trump, who has a history of making misleading and demonstrably false statements. You have to actively question, fact check, seek out diverse perspectives. Don't just take things at face value. It's a lot of responsibility on the shoulders of the listener, but it's crucial in this age of information overload and partisan media. And speaking of responsibility, it also raises questions about Rogan's role as the interviewer. Oh, definitely. He has this massive platform with a wide reach. 
By giving Trump such a free pass, he's essentially amplifying his message, giving it legitimacy in the eyes of some listeners. So you're saying he has a responsibility to be more skeptical, to push back more forcefully when presented with unsubstantiated claims. Exactly. I'm not saying he should be hostile or try to censor Trump, but he needs to be more than just a passive listener. He needs to ask tough questions, demand evidence, offer counterpoints when necessary. It's a delicate balance. It is. But I think you're right. There's a difference between giving someone a platform and simply acting as a mouthpiece for their views. Right. So this brings us back to our initial question. Is this episode a sincere and balanced exchange of ideas? Or is it something else entirely? That's for you to decide based on what we've discussed. We've tried to provide you with the key takeaways, highlight the areas where Rogan challenged Trump, and point out where he gave him free reign. We've also tried to contextualize some of Trump's claims, reminding you of relevant events and providing background information where needed. Now it's up to you to weigh the evidence, consider the potential biases, and draw your own conclusions about the sincerity and overall balance of this deep dive into the Rogan-Trump conversation. We'll be back with part three to wrap up our analysis. But for now, we encourage you to think critically about what you've heard and to continue exploring the issues raised in this interview. Right. It's wild to think about this interview happening with all this stuff going on in the Middle East. Right. Like when he talks about World War Three yeah. and then you see like what's actually happening. It's kind of scary. And it's not just that. It's like his whole attitude, you know, towards diplomacy and stuff. Yeah. He's like praising these strongman leaders. Right. And it's all about like military strength and confrontation. Yeah. It's like diplomacy is just not even on the table. And it really makes you worry about what he would do if he got back in power. Especially now with things being so tense. Exactly. Like his rhetoric just plays into people's fears. It makes it harder to find peaceful solutions. Yeah. It's like he's pouring gasoline on the fire. So, yeah. I mean, this interview, it's a big deal. Regardless of how you feel about Trump. Yeah. It shows you how he thinks. What his priorities are. And what kind of world he wants. Yeah. And it brings us back to those big questions we've been talking about. About the media and how they shape the narrative. Yeah. Like what's Rogan's responsibility here? Is he just giving Trump? A platform? Or is he actually trying to challenge him? And how do we as listeners make sense of all this? Especially with someone like Trump who's so good at manipulating the media. You can't just take his word for it. You got to be skeptical. Fact check everything. Get different perspectives. It's more important now than ever. With the election coming up. And all the crazy stuff happening in the world. So yeah, I think that's a good place to wrap up our deep dive into the Rogan-Trump interview. It was a lot to unpack. But hopefully it gave you some things to think about. And maybe even some things to worry about. But hey, that's what we do here at The Deep Dive. We try to make sense of the chaos. And give you the tools to think for yourselves. So until next time, stay curious, keep digging, and don't be afraid to challenge the status quo. See ya.